It's been a while since I could cover a massive DDoS taking a service down, and I don't think I can ever recall doing it with Cloudflare, because usually Cloudflare is the thing you use to prevent DDoSing. But then the details are where it gets really fun, because this outage that was a real outage that Cloudflare just experienced on their dashboard was caused by a DDoS from their own users because of a rogue use effect. Yes, Cloudflare, the DDoS prevention company, DDoSed themselves and caused their entire dashboard to go down because of bad React code. There is so much to dive into here. I love the fact that they put out this public postmortem and are as transparent as they are about it. But as you guys know, I've been deep in the trenches with Cloudflare for a while. I have a lot of friends who work there and have worked there. I know a lot of the details of how this React app is implemented. And I have some feedback for the team over at Cloudflare because this was preventable. And this was preventable around seven or so years ago when you were told in detail by some employees that this type of thing was inevitable if certain changes weren't made. Those changes weren't made. It seems like they will be now, but I want to make sure you guys understand both as viewers and as employees of Cloudflare, how to keep your company from destroying its own infrastructure by writing React code entirely incorrectly. I am super excited to dive into this as well as the community response to it. But as you know, I'm not being paid by Cloudflare. In fact, this hurts any opportunity I'll ever have to be paid by Cloudflare. Somebody's got to pay for us DDoSing ourselves. So quick word from today's sponsor, and then we'll dive right in. When I started a company, I thought my job was going to be writing a bunch of code, talking to users, and shipping a lot of software. In reality, it's a bunch of paperwork, weird business management stuff, and the absolute chaos of fundraising, and more importantly, hiring. Most of the founders I talk to spend way more time hiring employees than they spend actually working on their product, and they all want to die. Until I show them today's sponsor, G2i because these guys get hiring. They have some weird AI slot platform with hundreds of thousands of people in a database that aren't real. They're a new hybrid type of thing, somewhere between a software platform and a bunch of humans that have a list of people that they like and work with that they can refer to your company without costing you a whole bunch of money. Their team is all technical, so they understand what you actually need for engineering. If you need a really good engineer for two months to help you set up for your new mobile platform, or you need a couple pretty good engineers for three years to help maintain the product over time, they can flex as much as you need, especially if you're an early stage company. You shouldn't be hiring some recruiter to go find 10 people and you only need three. And you're certainly going to struggle trying to poach really good engineers if you need someone who knows their shit for the specific part of your stack. Hiring right is really, really hard. And G2I figured it out. Stop wasting your time trying to catch up and wasting your money on recruiters when you can work with someone that already gets it. Check them out today at soydev.link slash G2I. A deep dive into Cloudflare's September 12th, 2025 dashboard and API outage. What happened? We had an outage in our tenant service API, which led to a broad outage of many of our APIs and the Cloudflare dashboard itself. This incident's impact stemmed from several issues, but the immediate trigger was a bug in the dashboard itself. This bug caused repeated unnecessary calls to the tenant service API. The APIs were managed by a React use effect hook, but we mistakenly included a problematic object in its dependency array. Because this object was recreated on every state or prop change, React treated it as always new, causing the use effect to rerun each time. As a result, the API call was executed many times during a single dashboard render instead of just once. This behavior coincided with a service update to the tenant service API, which compounded instability and ultimately overwhelmed the service, which then failed over. I really don't like how this one is worded as though this is some inherent behavior in React that just happens. And then they gloss over the fact that they made changes to the API itself, which compounded the instability. I feel like this is where a lot of the more interesting details are, and this is just bad code written by a not great front end team, but we'll get to that in a bit. And I wanna be clear, I don't like dishing on the quality of people on a team, but I feel like it is necessary here because I know too much about the history of the Cloudflare dashboard team, and I know for a fact that they have pushed back on good engineers on the team, pointing out these types of problems, suggesting ways to fix it, and then just getting all of their changes gutted because some random person high up on the team doesn't like external libraries. Yeah, this is gonna be a rant about React Query, don't worry. When the tenant service became overloaded, it had an impact on other APIs on the dashboard because the tenant service is part of our API request authorization logic. Without tenant service, API request authorization cannot be evaluated. When authorization evaluation fails, API requests return 500 status codes. We're sorry about the disruption. The rest of the blog goes in depth on what happened and what steps are being taken to prevent it. So impact starts at around 1757. Also of note here, 1632, this is when the change has been to the dashboard where the endpoint was being hit more, no issues. Then they make the change to the tenant API service, suddenly issues. 
I think React is getting a bit too much blame here and the dashboard team is also getting a bit too much blame here because it seems like the tenant API service change is what actually caused the outage if you can just read basic timelines. I'm not liking this. So here we see 1757, impact starts. 1817, they provided more resources to the tenant API service, which caused 98% availability, but the dashboard still isn't recovered. The impact is decreasing. In an attempt to restore dashboard availability, some erroring code paths were removed and a new version of the tenant service is released. This was ultimately a bad change and it caused API impact again, which caused the impact to go up again. So an hour in, we went from slightly decreased to increased impact. Then they put up a rate limiting rule, which seems to have helped a lot. Problematic changes to the tenant API service are reverted and the dashboard availability returns to 100%. Okay, it sounds like this was the tenant API service, not the React front end code. Nowhere here did they say that they reverted the effect. It's kind of crazy when you look at the amount of words here that are calling out React. All of this is complaining about React. This is the tenant service API. And apparently changes to this didn't happen. And the one bad change they're talking about here was an over an hour and a half before the outage. And the outage occurred seven minutes after this part and was fixed after this part was resolved. I hate getting this into the way things are worded, but it seems to me as though the wording of this, at the very least, the number of words in this, leaning towards blaming the web devs in React is far too much, and the tenant service API changes far too little when you consider the fact that the tenant service API appears to be the actual root cause. That doesn't mean the React code wasn't bad and that it shouldn't be called out, but it does mean that this post is bad and shouldn't be trusted. Oh, God damn it, guys. I was really excited for this post too. I did not know it was gonna be this poorly assigned. Again, 1632 was when the change to the dashboard made. It's not even in this chart. It was 1750 when they deployed the new tenant API version, which is supposedly here, but then the huge drop occurred after where the responses just plummeted in response like reliability. The Cloudflare API service was severely impacted for two periods during the incident where the tenant API service was down. So here's when the API was out as a result. Our first goal in an incident is always to restore service. Often, this involves fixing the underlying issue directly, but not always. In this case, we notice increased usage across the tenant service, so we focus on reducing the load and increasing available resources. We installed the global rate limit on the tenant service to help regulate the load. Tenant service is a Golang process that runs on Kubernetes in a subset of our data centers. That is not how you describe the language named Go. <sighs> I'm sure that uh, Rob Pike loves that. We increased the number of pods available as well to improve throughput. While we did this, we had others on the team continue to investigate why we were seeing unusually high usage. Ultimately, increasing the resources available to the tenant service helped with availability, but it was insufficient to restore normal service. After the tenant service began reporting healthy again and the API largely recovered, we still observed a considerable number of errors being reported from the service. We theorized that these were responsible for the ongoing dashboard availability issue, and we made a patch to the service with the expectation that it would improve API health or restore dashboard to a healthy state. Apparently degraded it further. Second outage can be seen in the graph above. Painful to have an outage like this said, but that said, there are a few things that helped lessen the impact. Automatic alerting, quickly identified correct people to join the call. Additionally, the failure in the control plane, which has a strict separation of concerns from the data plane. Thus, the outage did not affect services on Cloudflare's network. The majority of users at Cloudflare were unaffected unless they were making configuration changes or using the dashboard. So how are they going to prevent this before I go into explaining other deeper details of how they fucked up? They use outages to make improvements, can be categories to reduce and eliminate impact or improvements to observability. So first, reducing impact, they use Argo rollouts. Da, 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 da. Had it been in place for tenant service, then it would have automatically rolled back. Cool, again, tenant service seems to be the problem. We restarted tenant service, everyone's dashboard began to re-authenticate with the API. This caused the API to become unstable again, causing issues in everyone's dashboard. It's a thundering herd, yeah. Once a resource or service is made available, everyone tries to use it all at once. Common, but it was amplified by the bug in the dashboard logic. Fix for the behavior has already been released via a hotfix shortly after the impact was over. Finally, the tenant service was not allocated sufficient capacity in order to handle spikes and load like this. Improving visibility. We immediately saw an increase in the API usage, but found it difficult to identify which requests were retries versus new requests. Had we known that we were seeing a sustained large volume of new requests, it would have made it easier to identify the issue. Cool. Here's an example of how someone could end up with code like this. We have a use effect with this fetch organizations function that fetches from the slash organizations endpoint. If no response, we throw an error. If there is a response, we get the JSON. We set the organizations to be the data. We set error to null, and we call this fetch call. We're also passing organizations as a dependency here. 
this, I would argue, is an obvious mistake. You wouldn't want to pass organizations here. Hopefully, your lint rules would catch it. But let's say you had const, uh, I don't know, user data equals an object with user ID, some ID. And we pass this because we actually use this inside of this fetch call. And now we have in the headers, content type, application JSON, authorization, bearer, user ID. Not perfectly realistic, but realistic enough. The problem here is that this user data dep is getting updated constantly because every time this function runs, anytime any change occurs, user data is being redefined because user data isn't defined out here as a constant. If it was, it'd be fine. It's not being defined higher up. It's not being memoized. It's just here in line, which means every single time this runs, user data is recreated as a new object. Since it's a different object than the previous one, it's going to force a revalidation, which causes this effect to run again, which causes the fetch call to run again. And then it completes and you get new organizations, which causes the component to re-render and you end up in an infinite loop where this happens over and over and over again. Yeah, very, very hilariously common. And here's what the same thing would look like with React Query. First, they broke out the fetch organizations here and they pulled user data out here. I don't love that. Instead, I would pass user data like this. Okay, it's complaining because it's not actually a TypeScript file. It doesn't know that. You can ask about the imports, whatever. You get the idea. And now we have the organization list component still, but we have a use query call. We have the query function and we have the query key, which is the stuff that we want to pass to it. Ideally, you would pass what we actually want here, like this. We pass user data. We get user data from somewhere else. You get the right idea. But the query key is what determines the state of this and whether or not it should rerun, etc. React Query makes it way easier to manage all of these things correctly. Ideally, you wouldn't even break this out. You would just put this in line, and you're good. You don't even need to break out the function. But React Query, as an abstraction layer here, solves so many of these problems which is why there were a handful of employees at Cloudflare pushing really, really hard for the company to move over to React Query to solve these problems. If you are fetching data in a use effect, you are using React incorrectly. Like, not most of the time, 100% of the time. There is no reason to fetch data in an effect. There are so many better solutions. At the very least, you should build your own equivalent of React Query, but as soon as you start doing it, you realize the reason why React Query is so good, because there's a lot of little things you don't want to deal with when you build it, like retries, like errors, like loading states, like suspense, like sharing data between queries that are the same in different places. There are so many things that make React Query's current exact implementation more than ideal, borderline perfect. In the ignorance necessary to pretend that you can do a better job with a bunch of okay React engineers in a gigantic code base that nobody's auditing properly. It, your hubris is the reason this happened, Cloudflare. Not React. This one's on you. One of the best reasons to use React Query has nothing to do with the implementation. It's just the existence of TK Dodo. I love this man so much. He is one of the lead maintainers, if not the lead maintainer, of React Query at this point in time. And his blog is genuinely incredible. One of the best reasons to use React Query is the fact that you can now benefit greatly from his insane series of blog posts all about React Query. This Practical React Query series is now 30 posts long, and each one of them is genuinely really useful for building better web applications. And the fact that this resource is not useful to Cloudflare right now, because Cloudflare is insisting on building things the old outdated way that was never recommended officially. In fact, there's a whole blog post on the React docs about how you should avoid using effects if you don't need to. Ugh, seriously, I've been glazing React Query forever now, and this is why. There are now documented outages of major infrastructure and services where at the very least, they're blaming use effect, but they're also not willing to move off it for some reason. Seriously, Cloudflare, if this isn't the wake-up call you need that your previous ex-employees were right and should be using React Query for all of these things, I don't know what's going to break it through to your thick skulls. It's fucking time. Whatever engineer is high up enough to push back on this should be let go. They are causing actual outages now. It's time to fix the way that you're fetching data in your app. It's time to move to React Query or something like it. There is no excuse for the size of Cloudflare in the work that you guys are doing to be making mistakes like this. No excuse at all. And as Dominic said here, your post is missing the obvious improvement. Going forward, we will refactor data fetching on the dashboard to use React Query. He is right. 
60% of React devs are right. The entire ecosystem has centralized on React query or small number are still using tools like SWR and other things that are pretty good too. There is no excuse to be this egregiously wrong. If you want to spend the majority of this article blaming React, it's probably time that you guys consider the real solutions. So on one hand, I don't know how much the use affects even the problem here, considering the way that the service was rolled out. But on the other hand, literally no excuse for having problems like this when there are better tools that the majority of React developers are already using. Just use React Query. I've never seen a better ad for it, and I've never seen such a failure to acknowledge how useful it would be. In the words of Dane, the CTO of Cloudflare, Guillermo from Vercel is a decent front-end designer, but knows nothing about networks. To which I'll retort, Cloudflare seems decent at networks, but they know nothing about basic web development techniques and practice. If you're going to talk shit, be prepared to get hit. It is time to get competent, to get like within the top 70th percent of web development. The state of the dashboard is abysmal, and you should be careful talking shit about the web ecosystem when you don't even know how to participate. Fix your goddamn dashboard. It's one of the worst pieces of technology I have to use on a regular basis. I hate the Cloudflare dashboard deeply. It is a miserable experience to use it. And maybe if you stop talking so much shit on front-end developers, you could actually hire a good one to fix your fucking problems. Sorry, Cloudflare. There's no excuse for this shit, and you should know how I actually feel. That's all I got to say on this one. Let me know what you guys think. And if you're a good front-end developer that's considering working at Cloudflare, make sure they know they need to fix this shit before you take the role. Until next time, peace nerds.